So good afternoon, everybody. I'm Netsi Firestein, the director of the Labor Project for Working Families, and we're really excited to be co-hosting this event with our great partners, Jennifer and Katie at the Kalmanovit Center. And this is actually the second forum we've done together on labor and work family issues, and we hope to be doing more in the future. I also want to introduce the Labor Project's new national policy director, Carol Joyner, who's is based in D.C., and we're really thrilled to be working with Carol to partner with unions and, and advocacy organizations to push for better workplace policies. For those of you who don't know the Labor Project, we've been around for about 18 years, and we partner with unions and advocacy groups to push for better workplace policies around work and family issues, and we do that through the bargaining process, through organizing, and through public policy. Today's event comes at a troubling, exciting, scary, and momentous time for workers in this country. As workers in Wisconsin, Ohio, and other states rise up against attacks on collective bargaining rights, it's telling that the governor of Wisconsin wants to limit collective bargaining to wages only. That means no bargaining over the quality of life issues that we're discussing today. We know that unions set the bar for all workers, and we know that the unions have won the eight-hour day and the weekend and overtime rules and on and on and on for all workers, not just for union members. So taking away the right to bargain on issues like mandatory overtime and flexible work hours and paid sick days will impact every worker in this country. It will set the bar at a new low. Unions have historically fought for public policies for all workers, not just their own members. And it is no secret that these attacks seek to curtail the political power of unions, power that fights for raising the minimum wage and the Family and Medical Leave Act and overtime laws. In California, our unions won the nation's first paid family leave law in 2002. That law covers almost every worker in the state. We were able to pass that law because we have a strong labor movement. The stakes are high for all workers. So some of the workers that I've met over the years, workers like Sandy, a 57-year-old administrative assistant at a large private university. Her adult daughter had recently died of cancer, and she asked her supervisor for a flexible schedule so she could take her grandchildren to grief counseling, and she was refused. Workers like Mary Ann, who's a single mom, whose school-aged daughter goes to a coffee shop in New York City every day after school from 3 to 5 because she can't afford an after-school program. And workers like Josephine, who I met through Chris Sook, who's in the audience from ATU Local 192 a number of years ago. Josephine was an older woman who had been a bus driver for many years. And she admitted to us with some embarrassment that when her children were very young, she had to leave the house at 5 a.m. to get to her shift, which started at 6. So she would lay out the clothes for her children and lay out their breakfast, and they would get dressed and have breakfast and walk to the bus stop by themselves. She just prayed that nothing bad would happen. These are the workers that drive our work at the Labor Project for Working Families. And if we can just zoom out, I just want to kind of give you a, a picture of the workforce kind of more statistically. Women are now almost half the workforce. In a report by Heather Boucher, she found that 90% of mothers and 95% of fathers report work-family conflict. No surprise to anyone who's a parent in the room. 70% of mothers with children under 18 are in the workforce. And most children are living in families where all parents work. Today, only one in five families have a parent at home, usually a wife at home. And I always like to say, I think we'd all like a wife at home, but most of us don't have that. And elder care issue, elder care is a growing issue. One in three workers have some elder care responsibilities. So on the other side of that, what do we have at the workplace? We have the United States, which is the only industrialized country with no paid maternity leave. Almost 50% of workers have not a single paid sick days to care for themselves or a family member. That means their choice when they get sick is to get no pay or go to work sick or send their child to school or childcare sick. Almost half of all workers are not covered by the Family and Medical Leave Act.
And most hourly and low wage workers, in fact, have no flexibility unless it's the flexibility that's imposed by employers. And our child care and elder care services are woefully inadequate, and the teachers and providers that do this work, that care for our loved ones, are underpaid and undervalued. For most families, it's a patchwork of services. So there's a mitch, mis, mismatch here. And I, last week, we watched a video by Michelle Obama where she called it a 21st century work workforce trying to fit into a 20th century workplace. So we need to set the bar higher for what today's working families need. A good job means lots of things, like the right to collectively bargain, good wages, pension, a health and healthy and safe workplace. But it also means having workplace standards for all workers so you don't have to choose between a paycheck and your family. So national minimum labor standards for all workers might include paid sick days for yourself and to care for a family member, workplace flexibility that the worker controls, part-time parity, family leave that is paid and job protected for all workers, and child care and elder care that is high quality, affordable, and that compensates the teachers and providers well. It's a new workforce. We need a new workplace so that workers don't have to choose, and we need a strong labor movement to fight for all workers.